On either side of the center handle is symbolic of Landmark's unique cultural upbringing in their two families. <coughs> Landmark have gratefully received wisdom, love, encouragement, and guidance from them. Later, after the exchange of vows, Mark and Land will light the center candle, signifying two families coming together and representing the union of their lives with Christ at the core. I am now going to ask Mark's mother, Janice, and Land's mother, Helen, to come up and light each side of the unity candle. Now let's join together in the song, Amazing Grace, and the words will be up on the screen. Um, 
completely wrong of me to be out of touch with the context we're in, a wedding. And if I don't primarily address the sermon to Lan and Mark here, uh, I'm clearly off somewhere else in the end. But these are precisely the people who are off somewhere else in their heads right now, who are least likely to listen to any word. Uh, and so I'm going to address Landmark, but I encourage you and invite you to listen in, both for your own sakes, but also so you can remind Landmark of something that I preach later on. Are we agreed? <laughs> What do you think of when I say the word love? Or when you hear that passage? Jesus, right? That's the right answer. <laughs> Probably not the first thing that came into your mind. In our day and age, we are inundated with media portrayals of love. Hollywood would have us believe that love is something that is heartwarming, romantic, exciting, spontaneous, emotionally charged, sexually charged, and passionate. It's not just romantic comedies that give us that depiction, but action movies, kids movies, dramas, the whole gamut. We may or may not see that Hollywood love is also frequently foolish, momentary, and unfaithful. Now I know you, Mark and Lan, do not buy into this Hollywood depiction because you are viewers of documentaries. <laughs> <laughs> when Paul wrote this passage to the church in Corinth, he didn't have marriage primarily in mind. Rather, he was talking about the church and what ought to characterize her and how a body of many members ought to relate to each other. Love, as this passage describes it, rather than how Hollywood depicts it, is what ought to characterize a Christian, because it is following in the footsteps of Jesus Christ himself. Jesus, God in the flesh, came to earth so that he could demonstrate his love for the world, which he did through his life, but most profoundly by suffering death at the half at the hands of and on behalf of humanity. In your marriage and through your love, you share and show to each other, you are helping each other radiate and experience the love of God. As you share this kind of love for each other, you are participating in the character of God. God is love. But let me reiterate, this is not some cheap, fluffy love we're talking about. This is the type of love that is absolutely committed, absolutely seeking the good of the other, even to the sacrifice of oneself. This is the type of love that is willing to die for the other, whether that might be in some heroic act of, in a despairing situation, or in the daily decisions and behaviors that puts the other above yourself. And so our passage identifies some of these behaviors and attitudes. Interestingly, in the original language, the items aren't listed as adjectives, as they are in English, but as verbs. Love is not merely descriptive, it is active. It has to be shown, and is identified by, by what it does and by what it does not do. Let me challenge you and exhort you as you enter into your marriage covenant with each other, let your marriage be based on this type of love. A love that acts patiently. Love bears patiently with the other, even under provocation. I am sure this has been put to the test in the stress of preparing for today. Know that after today, you will be able to breathe a sigh of relief. But your days of having to bear with, patiently with each other are not behind you. Time after time, you will need to choose to cool your jets when all you want to do is blow up 
and to your spouse. <coughs> love is kind. And love calls you to more than cooling your jet. It calls you to act practically in kindness, even mercifully to your spouse. Don't just blow up in retaliation to something that provokes you. Do something positive in response. The passage then goes to describe some negative things that love is not. The first one, envy. This is desiring after and begrudging what the other person has. So Mark, this means if Lan gets the job of her dreams, and you're still working at the port, <laughs> you don't downplay her achievement to make yourself feel better. You don't begrudge her in her joy. You celebrate with her. You take her out for a nice dinner, and you say how proud of her you are. What's good for one is good for both, because you are one flesh. And when one part suffers, you both suffer. And when one part prospers, you both prosper. Paul goes on to talk about boasting and pride. These have no place in a marriage, unless you're boasting about the other person and proud of them. You should be each other's biggest fan, cheering them on and building them up, rather than puffing yourself up to look better than your spouse. Marriage is not a competition, it's teamwork. And so then, when you have your 30th wedding anniversary, <laughs> and if Mark wants to plan a big party, and it kind of flops, don't tell him how you would have done it, and how you would have done it so much better than him. <laughs> cheer, his, cheer him on, cheer his efforts, and support him in all that he does. The, the sort of baseline of all the attributes is, is each thing that love does is something in which the ego does not dominate. Each thing that love does not do is something in which the ego does dominate. And so we see that as we go on with rudeness, being easily angered or irritable, keeping no records of wrong and resentfulness. As you walk this way of love, your walk will be one of righteousness and Christ-likeness. And so, it will, your marriage and the love you share will always protect, bearing all things, never tiring of support. It trusts and believes all things, never losing faith. It hopes all things, never exhausting hope and perseveres, enduring all things, never giving up. To love in this way is to share in the very character of God, and to express something that lasts in the face of eternity. Love never fails. Now, of course, in our human imperfection, we do fail. And in your marriage, there will be moments of failing. The true test of love, though, will be in those moments of failing, when your partner gets impatient, acts unkindly, is overcome with envy, boastfulness, arrogance, is rude towards you, acts selfishly, becomes irritable, resentful, brazen. How easy it is in such moments to respond in kind, where kindness has nothing to do with it. How easy it is to get offended, defensive, and push back. But in that moment, when your best friend feels more like your worst enemy, because they know all your buttons and can hurt you more than anyone else can, love calls you to patience, kindness, bearing with your spouse, believing the best of your spouse, and hope, hoping for the strengthening rather than the weakening of your marriage. And in that kind of love, you are following after Christ, who showed humanity love when humanity treated him like that and worse, 
killing him on a cross. In that moment of betrayal and pain, when love seemed on the verge of failing, Jesus did not respond in kind, but extended love all the more and died for those who rejected him and turned against him. Jesus extended grace to them and he extends grace to us. Land and Mark, having received that grace and accepted the love he freely offers, extend it to others, starting right at home with your spouse. And let love shine in your marriage, not as a fleeting feeling of emotion, but as an active way of life. Amen. Amen. Now let us stand together and we'll sing another song, Be Thou
In marriage, the rich giftedness and the imperfections each take their turns to dim and shine. As they do so, to strengthen the weaving of your married life, you will need to continually embrace faith, trust, and acceptance, which all equate to a deep and unconditional love for each other. In the first letter of John it reads, No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and God's love is perfected in us. When we love one another, we reflect God's love to the world. This is something I've heard each of you speak as a core foundation for yourselves and for you as a couple. And I have seen the love of God shining through you. Of all the men and women you have met, you have chosen each other as partners in life. To grow together in love, you will need to commit yourselves to each other freely and gladly. It is not a commitment to be entered into lightly. If you know of nothing legal or moral to, for, to forbid your vows, and wish now, freely and without reservation, to commit yourselves to each other, indicate that by joining your right hands. <laughs> we're, we're there. Overcome that obstacle. <laughs> Momentarily, Mark and Lan will be making their pledges and vows to each other. But before that, I would like to give you opportunity, as their family and friends, to pledge your support to this couple. You have journeyed with them in their lives to this point and as they join together in marriage. And so I ask you, will you, the families and friends of this couple, give your blessing to Mark and Lan in their marriage? Will you continue to love and support this couple in their marriage and spur them on to love, spur them on in love to uphold the vows they're about to make in times of difficulty as well as times of joy? Respond by saying, we will. You may be seated. I call on you both now, in the presence of God, and these assembled friends and families, to give expression to the commitment you are making to each other. Mark, you may make your promises to land. Please repeat after me. Lan, I take you to be my wife. Lan, I take you to be my wife. To laugh with you in joy. To laugh with you in joy. To grieve with you in sorrow. To grieve with you in sorrow. To grow with you in love. To grow with you in love. Serving Christ in peace and hope. Serving Christ in peace and hope. As long as we both shall live. As long as we both shall live. And Len, you may make your promises. Mark. Please repeat after me. Mark, I take you to be my husband. Mark, I take you to be my husband. To laugh with you in joy. To laugh with you in joy. To grieve with you in sorrow. To grieve with you in sorrow. To grow with you in love. <coughs> to grow with you in love. Serving Christ in peace and hope. Serving Christ in peace and hope. As long as we both shall live. As long as we both shall live. <laughs> Will you, Mark, have land to be your wife, to love, honor, and cherish for all your days? Respond by saying, I will. I will. <laughs> and will you, Len, have Mark to be your husband, to love, honor, and cherish him all the days of your life? I will. From the earliest of times, the golden circle of the wedding band has been a symbol of a faithful love. Your rings are made of pure gold to remind you daily of the challenge to keep your love pure. Being one unbroken circle, your ring symbolizes an unending love. May you cherish your love for each other as God's immeasurable gift 
as often as you see these bands, may you remember this high moment and the unending love you promise each other here today. You may not offer your rings to each other. <laughs> and now we'll be signing the registry, and so I ask the, the mothers of the bride and groom to come up with us and Shalom to play the harp.
around the tables? Yeah. Not really. They wouldn't fit here? Um.
up next, um, Mark and Lan are going to cut the cake, and, you know, do the, the traditional ceremony, so we're going to bring it out over there, and uh, Mark and Lan, please head over to the kitchen door there.